in the last part, took a look at Fourier analysis on the circle. This gave us a connection between functions on the circle and the representation theory of the circle. So, in a sense, this is a little bit more advanced than the type of thing we want to deal with for now. So, the idea is this is familiar, so we laid out pretty much the big result there that I want to get a handle on. So what we're going to do now is take a step back to finite abelian groups, and then once I have finite abelian groups sorted out, we'll move forward to general finite groups. Now, for finite abelian groups, what are we trying to get to? So we had this result for Fourier analysis. If I take L2 on the group, here we have a finite abelian group, so L2 is a little bit overkill of a statement, but we just want to emphasize that there's a norm here. This is going to break up into representation theory, a direct sum of inequivalent irreducible representations. And since I'm finite abelian, the irreducible representations are all going to have dimension one. Okay, a representation theorist would call this Peter Weil theorem. And for a finite abelian group, we're going to put that in quotes since Peter Weil is a little bit heavier than what we have here. All right, we're going to have a norm for functions just given by take your first function, multiply it by the conjugate of your second function, add that up over all points, and then just divide by the order of the group. With that inner product, we're going to have a group action for which our inner product's invariant just given by you push your group element to the inside of the function by the inverse. Okay, let's start recalling a few things and then we'll see some questions pop out. First thing I want to note, fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. So if G is a finite abelian group, we're going to be able to rewrite this as a direct product of some Z mod n's. And the rule is, is that as I move across, each n sub i is going to divide the next n sub i plus 1. And then we'll also have all of our n sub i's greater than 1 so we don't have any trivial terms in there. If you go back to part three, we took a look at all the one-dimensional representations for a finite abelian group, how we construct those. Okay, well, I saw how to construct G of these, order G, one-dimensional representations. Okay, and I avoided saying it, but just as a definition, we call these the characters. We'll have Another definition for characters later on, use that as a trace of a representation. So you have to check your context to be sure of what you mean by a character when it shows up. All right, some questions. Well, if you note, if I have a one-dimensional representation on the group, that's going to be a function on the group. And so that means we're looking at characters living inside of our L2 of G. Since I have order G of these, the first question we want to ask is, well, is that enough to get a basis of L2 of G? If, it, if we pass that question, then we can ask, do we have an orthonormal basis? And then if we pass that question, we can ask, can we go whole hog? Do we have an analog of the Fourier analysis on the circle? The answer to the first two questions is going to be short orthogonality relations. In quote, because this is a very special case of a much general theorem. If I have my two characters, chi1 and chi2, so these are just one-dimensional representations, take their inner product with respect to the L2 norm, then we're going to get, if they're equal, we get a 1. If they're not equal, we get 0. So this is telling us if I have a character, it's going to be a unit vector with respect to this norm. If I have two characters that are not equal, they're going to be orthogonal. So let's see how we get this. Now, in the case where they're equal, note, okay, if I apply my character to any point in the group, we're going to get something in the circle, so it's going to have length 1. So if I multiply it by its conjugate, we get a 1. I'm going to sum that up order g times, and so we're just going to wind up with order g over order g gives me a 1. So that takes care of the first case. For the second case, let's prove a slightly different result. What we're going to have is, if I have any character that's not exactly equal to 1, so it's not exactly the trivial representation, then if I sum over all of its elements, I'm going to get 0. Let's take a look at this. What are you going to do? 
you don't have the trivial rep, so we can find at least one point, I'll call it Y, where when we evaluate, we get a non-zero number. So what can I do? Well, I'm gonna sum over our character applied to every element in the group. Well, since this is a group, I can shift everything by Y, and it's still gonna give me the same sum. So I can pull the Y out then because we have a homomorphism. And so if I push this to the other side, we're left with one minus chi on our Y times our original sum. Since we're assuming chi of Y is not exactly equal to one, that's gonna mean our sum has to be equal to zero. So that proves my lemma. To finish off, to get our theorem, exercise. First thing we wanna show is if I take Okay, so if I have my group G, we're going to take all the characters. I'm just going to call that G star. I want to show that this is a group under product of functions. Once I have that, I'll also need show that if I take the conjugate of any character, it's going to give me another character, which is going to be the inverse character for the group. All right, that's enough to finish up to get our theorem. Now, we should keep going with this. So if P is prime, calculate what the character group for Z mod P is going to be. Okay, note here I'm not using units, so that's going to be the same notation if we look at the units in Z mod P, but that's not what we're talking about here. And then, although it's not in the same context of finite abelian groups, you can also go ask about the characters of the circle and of the integers, and then what's the connection between the two. Now, on the function side of things, we've just shown is that the characters are going to form an orthonormal basis for L2 of G. But we also want to take a look at the representation theory side of things. So note, if I let my group action on functions act on a character, what's going to happen? Well, we push it as the inverse. I could pull it apart because of the homomorphism property. And then I note I could take that inverse on the inside, move it to the outside, and then that turns into a bar. So if I fixate on one of these subspaces corresponding to the character, then what I'm going to have is that's going to just be equivalent to the conjugate of the character as a representation. OK, on the other hand, okay, if we go look at the representations we got out of part three, well, we now know they're going to account for all the irreducible representations of G. OK, also. Each one's going to occur exactly once in L2 of G. So that means I can write L2 of G as a representation of our group as this orthogonal sum here where I let our character range over all inequivalent irreducibles. OK, so that's what we're going to call Peter Vial theorem for finite abelian groups. Practical consequence of this, all right, well, somebody hand you any function on a finite abelian group, well, Peter Weil theorem says you can rewrite that as some linear combination of characters. So let's take a look. Okay, so let's say I take Z mod three. So our elements in here are zero, one, and two under addition. Okay, we're gonna take a look at L2 of this, and then I'm gonna have our third root of unity over here. So let's see what happens. We're gonna have three characters. We're gonna have the trivial one, which just gives me ones across. We'll have our first one, which is just going through, take your root, and then just square it to get your element at two. And then we just take the conjugate for our third character. Okay, we could check our lemma. Note, if you sum going across, if I take the trivial, I'll get a three. But then if I take chi one or its conjugate, when you sum that up, well, that's just gonna be, you multiply that sum by one minus our root. That's gonna give you one minus your root cubed or zero. So our lemma is going to hold for this case. All right, exercise. Well, one is to verify the sure orthogonality relations for these three characters. And then you should also take, say, this function. I'm going to send zero to one, one to two, and two to one. Rewrite that as a linear combination of characters.